So today we are starting a series of three lectures about the immune system. Remember, this was supposed to be the first system in this semester, or the second system, right? This is the hurricane system. <laughs> no. it was displaced. You have access in, uh, in your drive. You have the old PowerPoints, the ones, the ones that I uploaded uh, before the hurricane. And this is kind of a new version. It's a shorter one. Okay, we are going to, of course, we have to cover the normal parts. Uh, the, what is the uh, lymphatic system, their function. Okay, we are going to describe the three lines of defense of the body, something that you already have studied and you're going to review. Okay. What is innate, what is adaptive immunity, the cells and the proteins or antibodies, etc., that participate in these different defense responses. Okay, understand what is <coughs> the major histocompatibility complex or human leukocyte antigen, um, the type 1 and type 2, where they are, what they do, what type of cells have MHC1 and MHC2 and discuss hypersensitivity, explaining or giving examples of the four types of hypersensitivity. And we're going to be talking a little bit about food allergies, okay, which are very common. And there, are, and there is a lot of controversy around food allergies. And the more you try to read, the less you understand. Okay? <laughs> when should we give food to children? Very early. We have to wait. Okay. Nowadays, uh, or the, the, the latest uh, tendency is to try to give the food as soon as possible and not delay the introduction of certain foods, okay? Because they have discovered that delayed introduction of the food is related to more allergies, for example, peanut allergy, okay? So there is a lot of controversy around this. This is the definition of immunity. And I put this, put it like this because I consider very interesting. Okay, this is the origin of the word immunity from immunis and immunitas. That means exception from government taxes. <laughs> <laughs> you want to be immune? <laughs> Some people used to be immune and they didn't pay taxes. Interesting. <laughs> Now, immunity, we use, we're going to use immunity as a protective or defense mechanism of our body. Protects us from disease, okay? It's important to have clear uh, the concepts, okay? Some students sometimes confuse an antigen with an antibody, okay? Antigens, remember, are um, a short for antibody generator, so it's anything that is able to stimulate and initiate an immune response. Okay, any molecule that is recognized and stimulate the cells of the immune system to produce an immune response are called antigens. There are sometimes heteroantigens, so they come from other places, can be bacteria, can be, can be from viruses, or can be from tissues of other people. And autoantigens, which are our own proteins, that sometimes uh, are recognized as non-self by our immune system. So our body starts attacking itself. These are examples of antigens. We have some polysaccharides, like for example, the ones in the cell walls of the bacteria, proteins like viral capsids, flagella of bacteria, some lipids like mycolic acid that is present in tuberculosis, some components of myelin can be considered antigens, and some nucleic acids, for example, the double-stranded RNA. Okay, normally our ma genetic material is composed of DNA. Our DNA is double-stranded. And then we make a copy of one of the chains to make RNA, which is single-stranded. Okay, it has only one chain. Some viruses have RNA, double RNA chain. So the presence in, in our body of double-stranded RNA is recognized immediately as foreign. And our body initiates an immune response against this type of chemicals. 
Okay, so different things. This is just a, a very short list. There are many things that can be considered antigens and are able to create an immune response. Now, antibodies or immunoglobulins are glycoproteins that are made by the B cells and plasma cells in response to antigen. Okay, this is, or these immunoglobulins are part of the plasma proteins. And it's important when you study this, uh, notice the details that appear. For example, we have here some of the plasma proteins that are made not by the liver, but are made by cells in the lymph nodes. Okay? So when someone has, for example, liver failure, they are likely to have low levels of the plasma proteins that are made by the liver, albumin and clotting factors. Okay, except factor eight that is made by the endothelial cells, and in this case the immunoglobulins has, are going to be normal as well. They normally these immunoglobulins are a very important part of the humoral immunity. Okay, remember the specific defenses, the acquired defenses are or have two branches: the cellular immunity, T cells uh, or B cells, sorry, the T cells that can be CD8 or CD4 and the antibodies that are made by these B cells when they become plasma cells. Okay, these immunoglobulins can be found on the B cell surface. If you have a B cell that has not been stimulated, they are gonna have antibodies bound to the membrane. Okay, this is how they are found. They are called B cell receptors. Once we stimulate this B cell, once these antibodies match with their specific antigen, this B cell is going to become a plasma cell with lots of uh, rough endoplasmic reticulum. And instead of having the antibodies bound to the surface, it's going to start producing antibodies that are going to go to the circulation. And you're going to see thousands and thousands of antibodies per second. It's going to Imagine you take a, a piece of paper and put it on a photocopy machine and put 2,000, start, and this machine starts copying two th and making 2,000 copies per second. This is more or less what these cells do until they get depleted and they die. Okay, there is a moment when they simply die of, uh, because of these uh, high activity. Antibodies, we are going to see later a picture. They have two regions. One is called the constant region that normally binds to phagocytic cells, macrophages, for example, and activate the complement. And they have a variable region that is the one that binds to antigens. <coughs> okay, here, here we have the shape of the antibodies. I think we mentioned before in one lecture that they have a heavy chain, two heavy chains, okay, and two light chains. Notice that we have uh, represented one part there in purple. This is the variable region. And then we have this tail here that is considered the constant region. This is the part that binds to the macrophages. Okay? And that is the part that binds to the antigens. And all of the B cells of the body have a different co a variable region. It's like having <coughs> thousands and thousands of different barcodes on top of these uh, variable regions that are trying to recognize what is the antigen that matches to them. Okay? All of the combinations possible of different proteins and different amino acids. Different types of antibodies. Okay? IgG, what is the shapes and the number of uh, light and heavy chains? This is an IgG, it's a small antibody. This is the IgA. Notice that there are two of these bound by their tails. Okay, this chemical structure is very important because this is the antibody that is going to be secreted, for example, to the breast milk, to the saliva, to the sweat, to the mucus. This immunoglobulin is called secretory immunoglobulin because it's the one that is going to be present in the secretions, saliva, tears, etc. And the function it has is neutralize bacteria, viruses, fungi that enter in contact with the human secretions. IgM, notice that there are five of these structures here. 
forming a huge structure, okay, huge structure that has the objective of binding to as many antigens as possible to neutralize them. Okay, this is the one that we normally produce immediately after we get in contact with an antigen. Okay, then after we mount a strong immune response, the cells shift from making this IgM to making IgG that is a more specific and stronger antibody uh, that will find more effectively, will, will fight more effectively the antigens. Okay, IgM is the one that we normally find in acute infections. IgG is the one that we are gonna find in chronic infections or when people simply are immune to that condition. IgD, now this is, uh, there is very little that we know about IgD. We simply know that it's mixed with these uh, B cell receptors, probably making stronger the connection or the recognition of the antigen. And IgE, as we have studied previously, is the one that participates in allergic reactions. Okay, when uh, we stimulate a T cell, they can take two pathways, okay, the Th1 response or the Th2 response. Okay, if they become Th2 cells, they're gonna start producing this IgE, and it's gonna bind to the mast cells, and it's gonna initiate allergic reactions if we get in contact with this allergen again. There you have exactly what uh, we have been explaining before, okay, where we find them, okay? What do we know about these uh, different immunoglobulins? IgE, IgG, etc. Okay, one important thing is that these IgG, because of their size, is able to cross the placenta. Yeah, they are really, really tiny proteins. They are able to cross the placenta into the fetus. So if there is any antigen in the fetus that these IgG proteins are able to recognize, they are going to attack the red blood cells or the tissues of the fetus. Okay, and sometimes, for example, uh, a woman is infected by HIV and she has IgG against HIV. This is going to pass the placenta. And even though maybe the fetus is not infected, okay, it's going to test positive for HIV because of the presence of the maternal antibodies in the blood of the fetus. Mm -hmm. So is it safe to say that the IgB is, has, I guess, synergistic effects with the Ig, Ig um, with the um, B cell? Um, it's present on the surface of the B cell, okay, together with the B cell receptors, okay? The function, exactly the function, is not understood, probably because there is not, there is not enough investigation about that. Okay, because probably if we are not gonna solve any problem, probably it's not, nobody's gonna give you money to make a research. Okay, researchers don't have money, people who have money want profit. It's not because just you, you want to know what is the problem. Okay, what issue are you, are you gonna solve when you find out? Mm -hmm. Oh, that disease, disease of, I don't know. Oh, how many patients are there? One patient. Hmm. Oh, 10 million patients, okay. If you find the, the solution, I know that these 10 million patients are gonna pay me back. Okay, so if there is no profit, it's very difficult to find money for them. And nobody's gonna, even though everybody's asking, <coughs> what is the response for? Okay. Why the moon is always in the same position and never turns the other side to us? What are you gonna solve <laughs> by investigating? <laughs> So here you have something uh, that are the different functions that the antibodies have. Okay, we have to know well. Okay, there are uh, the function, for example, of neutralization. Okay, notice that for a virus to infect a cell, they need to bind to the cell receptors. Okay, the virus have proteins. And sometimes these proteins match with the cell receptors, for example, for cholesterol or for hormones or for neurotransmitters. Okay, so what our body does is to surround the virus with antibodies so the virus doesn't find any way to attach to the cell receptors, okay? 
you can neutralize, you can surround a virus, you can surround a bacterium, so they don't uh, find a place to enter into the cells. Then we have also agglutination, okay? We have all of these antibodies forming complexes with the antigens and forming a big mass, like grouping all of the antigens together so it's easier to pick them up by the macrophages. Okay, sometimes they can precipitate because of their weight. We are going to see the implication of this. Okay? And also something that can happen is because of the union with the, between the antigens and the antibodies is the activation of the complement. Complement is a series of proteins that activate one another in a cascade fashion, leading to the opening a hole in the cells, normally foreign cells, and making them explode, for example, bacterial cells. Okay, all of these processes of neutralization, agglutination, and precipitation enhances phagocytosis. Okay. Macrophages are looking for things that are surrounded by antibodies. When they find something that is surrounded by antibodies, that is food for them. So they go and they bind to this tail. Remember, this tail is constant for all of the antibodies, and this is recognized by a receptor in the macrophages. Macrophages involve bacteria or cells or anything that is surrounded by antibodies and swallows it and spits the rest. These are different processes that occur as a result of the union between the antibodies and the antigens. And here we have the major histocompatibility complexes, okay, also known as human leukocyte antigen. And it's important to know this because the interaction with T cells requires direct contact Okay, and are restricted to contact using MHC1 or MHC2. T cells don't talk to anybody and don't recognize any antigen unless they are presented either on MHC1 or in an MHC2 molecule. Okay? Here we have an example of a nucleated cell. I mean any nucleated cell of the of the body. Remember, all cells have nucleus except the red blood cells, they are going to have the MHC1 complex, the class 1, and there we have the antigen presenting cells. We have the dendritic cells, the B cells, and the macrophages that present the antigens in the class 2 MHC, but they also, since they have a nucleus, they also present antigens in the class 1. Okay. Normally, what cells recognize MHC1 and MHC2? Well, let me give you one example. Let's imagine this is a dendritic cell. Dendritic cell. They are antigen presenting cells. Normally, when they are infected, or when they pick up an antigen in the periphery, let's say in the skin, in the mucous membrane, they are going to travel to the lymph nodes. And they are going to be using the MHC2 to present the antigen to a CD4 cell, which is the T herpel cell. Okay? Then what is going to happen? This CD4 is a nucleated cell, but it's not a professional antigen presenting cell. It's going to present the antigen using the MHC class 1. MHC class 1 to B cells. There's going to be like a dialogue between the CD4 and the B cell. If they agree that what they have in between is a real antigen, it's like a check and balances. Do you think so? Yes, I think so. I do agree. Yes, I agree. So let's initiate a new response. Okay? If they agree that this is an antigen, this B cell is going to become a plasma cell. But it's going to divide, divide, divide. Some of them are going to become memory cells. Others are going to become plasma cells. And it's going to start producing antibodies. Okay. Now, these antibodies are going to fight extra cellular pathogens. Okay. Another thing that this CD4 cell can do 
is using another MHC1, MHC1, present the antigen to a CD8. Okay, CD8. Recognize this antigen, get activated, and they become cytotoxic cells. Okay? Cytotoxic cells. And they're going to travel into the circulation to the place where the infection is. Okay, let's imagine we have here an epithelial cell that is infected. This cell has the MHC1. with a little piece of the virus there, or any antigen, this cytotoxic T cell is going to bind there, and it's going to initiate the destruction of that cell. Okay, in a nutshell, what I'm trying to say is that CD4 cells recognize antigens that are presented in MHC2 uh, complex while CD8 recognize antigens that are presented in the MHC class 1 complex. Okay, all of this is explained very well in these resources that I mentioned before. That's why I tell you that you have to study this together with that website and very carefully listening to the videos. Okay, there you have the CD4 T cell. Notice how it's recognizing an antigen, this red thing is the antigen that is presented in this molecule that is the MHC class 2. Okay, and notice what is the function, why we say that these CD4 cells, or we call these cells CD4, because they have this protein, okay, that is the CD4 protein that makes the union stronger between the T cell receptor and the MHC class 2. This thing here is the T cell receptor, or the CD4 cell receptor, and this thing here is the MHC <coughs> class 2. In the middle, the antigen. Okay, these lymphocytes, these T cells don't recognize antigens that are floating around there. Okay, they have to recognize the antigen only if they are presented in this MHC. In the case of the CD8, they are called CD8 because they have this protein here that is the CD8. CD means cluster of differentiation. This is the T cell receptor in blue. This is the antigen in red. And this yellow protein here is the MHC class 1. <coughs> Notice the difference between antigen presenting cell showing the antigen to the T helper and target cell. This CD8 is the cytotoxic cell that is going to destroy that one. Okay? It's going to send a signal for apoptosis so that cell is destroyed. This is how this dialogue between cells occur. Okay? When you study the immune system, you're going to be amazed of how these cells can talk to each other in such a way. And this is um, how the immune response works in general. It's not the first time that you see this. There we have the first exposure. Well, there, this is a diagram that shows, uh, in one side, the humoral or antibody-mediated immune response, and in this part, the cell-mediated immune response. Everything works together. Okay, we divide this for the purpose of a study, but there is one single immune response that is mediated by all of these factors. One of them can predominate depending on if we have extracellular pathogens or intracellular pathogens or cancer cells. Okay? We have the first exposure to an antigen. Okay? This is engulfed by an antigen presenting cell, dendritic cell, for example. These cells travel to the lymph nodes, stimulate helper T cells. Notice the helper T cells stimulating itself by releasing cytokines, autocrine 
secretion. And notice the helper T cell stimulating B cells and stimulating cytotoxic T cells. Okay? The antigen can also stimulate directly the B cells. <coughs> okay, it's an antigen that is floating and is taken by the lymph, lymphatic vessels and enters into a lymph node and simply binds to the B cell receptor. This B cell can be stimulated alone without the help of the helper T cell, as you can see here. Okay, the antigen <coughs> presenting cell also can present cells directly to the cytotoxic cells. Okay, this can occur as well. Now, the helper T cell is the one that is going to stimulate the B cells to become plasma cells and also memory cells. And at the same time, it's going to stimulate the cytotoxic cells to become active cytotoxic T cells and also memory cytotoxic T cells. If we don't have the helper T cell, this formation of memory cells doesn't occur. And if we don't have the helper T cells, when these plasma cells start producing IgM, which is the first immunoglobulin produced by the plasma cells, there is no one who stimulates them to shift and start making IgG, which is a more effective immunoglobulin. So we are going to have an immune response, but it's not going to be as strong as the immune response that we have when the helper T cell is there. Okay? Now, notice that this stimulation formed memory helper cells, memory B cells, and memory cytotoxic cells. If there is a second exposure to the same antigen, second exposure, all of this process that we mentioned before is not going to happen. The memory helper B and cytotoxic cells are going to be stimulated directly, and the immune response is going to start immediately. Okay? From this first antigen exposure to the moment in which we have enough antibodies to protect the body can pass 7, 10, or 15 days. When we stimulate directly the memory cells, the response is very fast, 24 hours, 48 hours, okay? and with a higher level of antibodies of the type IgG. Okay, these memory cells don't start by making IgM to later become produce IgG. They simply produce IgG from the very beginning. Okay, what is the response when we have extracellular pathogens? Antibody production. These floating antibodies are gonna go through the lymphatic vessels, through the veins, to the places of infection to fight bacteria. How they know where they have to go? Well, they don't have a GPS, nothing like that. Mm -hmm. But remember, in the places of injury, we have something that is called inflammation, vasodilation, with movement of plasma into the tissues. So since these places are leaky, the antibodies are likely to go to those places. And that's the way they find their antigens. Now, the cytotoxic cells are the ones in charge of fighting virus-infected cells or cells that have become a cancer. And we can't forget to talk about the natural killer cell. The natural killer cell simply is part of the non-specific response. This is one of our cells that is making a MHC1. Just in case she's infected, she can put some antigen there. Okay? The natural killer cell is simply looking for the presence of this. Okay, it's like asking for the ID to all of the cells of the body. Do you have MHC1? Yes. Is this the MHC1 that I am able to recognize as self? Okay. Go to the next, go to the next, go to the next. When cells become cancer, or when cells are infected by a virus, they stop making this. So the natural killer cells don't find the ID, and they kill the cell. Or if I take cells from someone else, and I put them inside my body, like when you have a tissue transplant, there will be a different MHC1. So the natural killer cells 
don't recognize this as self and destroy this self. Okay? That's why we have to look for someone that is compatible, a compatible donor when there is a, an organ transplant. Major histocompatibility, compatibility of tissues complex. Okay? When we want, want a donor that matches okay, a person, we have to look for an MHC that is as close as possible in the structure to the one that is recipient of these uh, tissues. So you have to study this several times by yourself in order to try to get, to get these things. Because we have to talk about allergies and hypersensitivity reactions. Okay, it's important to know what is an allergy. Allergy is simply one of the types of hypersensitivity that we are going to study. There are four. Allergy is synonym with hypersensitivity type 1. Okay, everybody develops immune reactions to antigens. Now, some people develop immune reactions to substances that most of the people never develop immune reaction. Okay, that's why these antigens are called allergens, because they stimulate an allergic reaction. It's one of the types of hypersensitivity. We are going to study the four types. Okay, so allergy is the first one normally equated with type 1 hypersensitivity, that produces an immediate hypersensitivity reaction that is mediated by one type of immunoglobulin, that is IgE. These are the four types. And I tried to make something else. I'm not, I don't know if this is going to help you or it's going to confuse you more. I tried to make an ABCD there. Okay. The first three types are antibody mediated, are mediated by different types of antibodies. And the fourth type is mediated by cells. That's why it's called cell mediated uh, uh, hypersensitivity. Thanks. The type one is the A. Notice that there are two A's there. It's called anaphylactic or atopic or immediate hypersensitivity. It occurs very fast within two hours of the contact with the allergen. Okay, then we have the type 2. The type 2 is cytotoxic. Okay, there is a direct cytotoxicity to the cells. You are going to see that for some reason the cells get surrounded by antibodies. Antibodies on top of the cells means they are tagged for destruction. Okay, so we call this antibody-mediated cytotoxicity or cytotoxic hypersensitivity. The type 3 is also mediated by antibodies, but antibodies bound to their antigens forming complexes. Okay, they bind together forming complexes of antigen and antibody. These complexes sometimes become very heavy or very large and they can de be deposited in the endothelium and create an inflammatory reaction. And then we have the delayed, of course, late hypersensitivity that is cell-mediated. We are going to study that there are two subtypes of this. We are going to try to understand the important things and some examples of these hypersensitivity reactions. Well. I don't think I have to explain you the mechanism of the type 1 hypersensitivity, because we are tired of talking about how allergic reactions occur. Okay? Some people are exposed to an allergen. Okay? In the case of, uh, for example, peanuts allergy can be skin exposure. Okay? I can be, uh, I have a baby at home that has never tried peanuts because he's one month old. And I'm preparing peanut butter. Oh, it smells very good, right? Oh, the baby's crying. And I have the baby in my hand. I am, the, the skin of the baby is exposed to peanuts. It's a very soft skin, so it's a, very likely to absorb the proteins and stimulate the immune system. Okay? And then maybe it's never exposed again to peanuts. And when the kid is two years old, eats peanuts and develops an allergic reaction. How is this possible if this is the first time 
that the baby ate peanuts. Well, there was a skin exposure, okay? Also, some cosmetic products, some soaps, some uh, lotions for the skin can contain certain proteins from wheat, okay, from soy, from different things, and, that, and they produce a an skin exposure to different allergens that then, when eaten, can produce different types of conditions. So there is an initial exposure to an allergen that we don't know when or how occurs that stimulates the Th2 cells. Okay, these Th2 cells produce some interleukins, 4 and 13, that stimulate the B cells to make IgE antibodies that attach to mast cells and basophils. When that happens, when the mast cells and the basophils are surrounded by IgE, the person is said to be hypersensitized to this specific allergen. Then when there is a second exposure, there is a cross-linking between these IgE that are uh, surrounding the mast cells and the basophils, and this produces the release of several cytokines, for example, histamine, heparin. And the effects of histamine, remember, is vasodilation, leakage of uh, plasma and proteins, okay, swelling, smooth muscle contraction producing bronchoconstriction, intestinal hypermotility, and inflammation. Of course, this depends on the portal of entry of the antigen. If we inhale the antigen or the allergen, we are going to have a respiratory problem. If people swallow the antigen, they are going to have more gastrointestinal problems. This reaction is immediate. Remember, we are stimulating pre-sensitized cells. Okay? Well, we're, that we're completely prepared to form this immune response. So, of course, immediately, some hours after uh, this response, there will be a late phase reaction <coughs> that is mediated by other products and other inflammatory cells, like leukocytes, uh, neutrophils, etc. And we have products of arachidonic acid, like prostaglandins and leukotrienes. We can cut this reaction at every point by using antihistamines and inhibiting the release of these chemical mediators. These are examples. Okay, hay fever, which is allergic rhinitis, allergic asthma, and different anaphylactic reactions, which are sometimes very severe. Anaphylaxis, well, it's a life-threatening, it's an acute reaction, okay, life-threatening reaction um, that will occur in people who are pre-sensitized by these different allergens, can be medications, can be food, can be different things. And will produce a systemic response, okay, because of the release, massive release of different uh, inflammatory mediators from these cells. Okay, in the cases of uh, anaphylactic reactions, we are going to have involvement of different systems, at least two systems may be involved. For example, the skin, respiratory tract, cardiovascular system, neurologic system, GI system. And sometimes it's going to lead to a situation of shock. If we have um, generalized um, vasodilation what happened, guys? Low blood pressure. Um, it can lead to an anaphylactic shock. This can occur as a result of aller allergy to medications, to food, okay, immunotherapy, okay, insect stings, etc. Which are, these are the most frequent causes of this. Anaphylaxis, remember, is something that will occur very fast, immediately after the exposure to a medication or to food, etc. Okay, one hour maximum after the exposure, and can produce urticaria. Okay, something that is called angioedema, which is a localized edema, for example, of the airways. If it, if it occurs, occurs in the airways, it's an emergency, of course, compromising the respiratory tract. Vasodilation, dyspnea, wheezing, rhinitis, different things 
and even shock, depending on the cardiovascular involvement. This is the pathogenesis of anaphylaxis. There we have uh, the different inflammatory mediators that will participate. Okay. And you're going to study some ways of inhibiting the action of these inflammatory mediators, inhibiting the action of the prostaglandins, histamine, leukotrienes, okay, nitric oxide. All of these factors will lead to increased vascular permeability. In that case, what happens is a leakage of fluid okay, from the vascular space into the inter interstitial fluid. Vasodilation can lead to myocardial dysfunction, hypotension, and cardiovascular collapse. Notice that after the generalized vasodilation, up to 50% of the intravascular volume can move to the interstitial space. Imagine having, if someone has five <coughs> liters of blood, okay, imagine half of the plasma moving into the interstitial space. What is left is all of the solid elements of the blood with half of the plasma circulating. That will lead to an immediate cardiovascular collapse. This can occur, occur in minutes after the anaphylaxis starts. Okay, when we stimulate these smooth muscles, there will be bronchospasm, asthma, asthma, and also women can have uterine cramps during this phenomena. The autonomic nervous system will produce tachycardia, sympathetic nervous system with anxiety, mucus hypersecretion. There will be increased platelet aggregation, recruitment of more immune cells that will create a systemic inflammatory response. Okay, this is a very uh, hard to treat condition. Now we have the type 2 hypersensitivity reaction. Remember this is called cytotoxic hypersensitivity in which antibodies are directed against antigens that are present on the surface of the cells. These antigens, or sorry, these antibodies can be present on our cells, for example, red blood cells, or any other cell, or also uh, on the cells that come from outside, okay, or in any tissue component. These reactions involve IgG or IgM. Okay, important to have clear the differences. Type 1 IgE, type 2 IgG or IgM bound to the cell surface that will later fix the complement and activate the complement creating an inflammatory reaction around those cells or around those tissues. So there are, um, this is the pathogenesis, antibodies, target, cell surface, components, cell surface antigens, and this will result in something that is called opsonization. Opsonization is a fancy word that means there is a cell and the cell is surrounded by antibodies. This is the meaning of opsonization, surrounded by antibodies. Complement activation and recruiting of inflammatory cells like macrophages, neutrophils, natural killer cells, impairing, of course, the cellular and tissue functions. This is the basis of the destruction of red blood cells and platelets in autoimmune hemolytic anemias and immune thrombocytopenia, for example. Okay, we have red blood cells or platelets that are surrounded by antibodies, opsonization, and destroyed by the cells of the immune system. In some other diseases, we can have immune reactions that interfere with the function of the cell without destroying the cell. For example, there are diseases like myasthenia gravis and Graves' disease in which we have antibodies that target only cell receptors. Receptor for acetylcholine in the case of myasthenia gravis or receptor for TSH in the case of Graves' disease. Okay. These TSH uh, antibodies will target the TSH receptor, stimulate the TSH receptor, and make the thyroid gland to produce more hormone instead of destroying the gland. The same in myasthenia gravis. We don't destroy the cells. We simply block or stimulate receptors without making any other damage to these tissues. So in some cases, destruction of the cells, hemolytic anemia, 
okay, thrombocytopenia, and in some cases, disruption of the cell function without destroying the tissue. Both cases are considered type uh, 2 hypersensitivity reaction. And then we have the same thing in a diagram. Okay, here we have a cell that is opsonized, simply surrounded by these uh, antibodies. Okay, notice how this uh, creates the activation of the complement okay, and attracts phagocytes that will destroy the cell. If this is a red blood cell, will create hemolytic anemia. If this is a platelet, will create thrombocytopenia. Here we have uh, the activation of the complement leading to uh, opening of a hole in the cells okay, that will lead to the release of certain substances from the cells and lead to inflammation and tissue injury because of the release of uh, enzymes and different uh, free radicals from the cells that are destroyed. Complement mediated inflammation in the tissues. And in this case, we have the example of antibodies bound to the acetylcholine receptor blocking the action of acetylcholine, which explains the pathogenesis of myasthenia gravis. And here we have antibodies against the TSH receptor that will hyperstimulate the cells, making them to make more uh, thyroid hormones. Notice that in this case, we have an inhibition of the function of the cell, and in that case, we have an stimulation of the function of the cell without destroying the tissues. Okay, examples of type two, type two hypersensitivity reactions. And these are more examples. Okay, immune hemolytic anemia, drug immune hemolytic anemia, immune thrombocytopenic purpura, but also we have uh, what is called erythroblastosis fetalis or RH hemolytic disease of the newborn. We have uh, autoimmune hyperthyroidism, as we mentioned before, Graves' disease, rheumatic heart disease, myasthenia gravis, pain fibus vulgaris, and one that you studied recently that is pernicious anemia. In this case, we have antibodies against the parietal cells, okay, and also sometimes antibodies against intrinsic factors. In the case of pernicious anemia, of course, the cells are going to be destroyed. Okay. In Penfigus, you remember against was against what was the antibody? Desmosomes. Okay. Desmosomes. Let's have a ten minutes break okay, before going to the type three hypersensitivity. immediate hypersensitivity, type 2, which is also antibody mediated, but it's an antibody mediated cytotoxicity, IgM and IgG participate there. We saw some examples, hemolytic anemia, thrombocytopenia. The type 3 is the one that occurs as a result of immune complex reactions that are circulating immune complexes which are very heavy and very large structures. This is an, anti an antigen that is taken by an antibody, and at the same time has another antigen there. And this antigen is also taken by another antibody that happens to have another here. And this is taken by another that has another. <coughs> and yes, then we have one here, another here. And you can have a huge chain or a huge complex of these antigens and antibodies. Okay. These compounds, these structures can become large or heavy and get deposited in the epithelial cells, for example, in the venules after the capillary beds, 
and create inflammatory <coughs> reactions, okay? And we'll create complement activation. And you know what happens when you have inflammation after the complement activation with the destruction of the tissues. And there we have some examples, glomerulonephritis, serum sickness, that occurs as a, an adverse reaction to drugs, rheumatoid arthritis, again serum sickness, <laughs> probably very important. <laughs> Something that is called Arthur's reaction that occurs as a reaction or vasculitis when we uh, receive a, a tetanus or, dif or a vaccine containing diphtheria and tetanus, we can have a local inflammation with vasculitis because of the deposition of these anti and antibody complexes in the tissues. Lupus, polyarteritis nodosa, and post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. Okay, these are examples of type 3 hypersensitivity mediated by um, antigen antibody complexes and complement activation. And the type 4 is called delayed hypersensitivity reaction. Okay? Notice that we call this delayed because of course 24 to 48 hours develop after a challenge with an antigen. Okay? Remember when we have a PPD or a MANTU test, okay? we have antigens deposited under the skin and they tell us, come in 48 hours to see if this is positive or not. Okay? They don't make us wait one hour there. Like, for example, when they do an allergy test on the skin. There are two subtypes. Okay? This is, remember, mediated by T cells. Okay? We have uh, one subtype that is called delayed hypersensitivity, and the other that is, that is called cell-mediated hypersensitivity. I know this can be a, a bit confusing. And I think I made a mistake there. It's not hypersensitivity, it's cytotoxicity, I think. <coughs> Cytolysis, okay, or cytotoxicity. Please, let's fix this. Instead of hypersensitivity, it's cytotoxicity. Okay, cell-mediated high uh, cytotoxicity. One is hypersensitivity, and the other is cytotoxicity. The delayed hypersensitivity is mediated by Th1 cells and Th17, other type of T helper cell. Examples are contact dermatitis, type 1 diabetes mellitus, Crohn's disease, and multiple sclerosis. Remember contact dermatitis? And cell-mediated cytotoxicity, please fix this. Someone is looking at an opto, remembers. Uh-oh. <laughs> Uh-oh, what's this? Side This is mediated by CD8 cells. Remember, CD8 cells, when they're activated, are called, are called, are called cytotoxic T cells. So cell mediated cytotoxicity, and is the basis of the rejection to organ transplants, for example. Simply, the cytotoxic cells see a cell that doesn't belong to our body and attacks these cells. So then we have uh, presensitized CD4 lymphocytes, for example, of the Th1 subtype or the Th17 subtypes that produce cytokines, mainly interferon gamma, okay, that activate macrophages and recruit other inflammatory cells like macrophages that produce tumor necrosis factor and lead to inflammation. The Th17 also produces some cytokines that recruit leukocytes and, uh, for example, neutrophils. Okay, notice that here we don't have any IgE or IgM, okay, simply inflammatory mediators, cytokines, interferon gamma, tumor necrosis factor. Okay. The CD8 cytotoxicity, in this case, the cytotoxic cells directly kill host cells. Examples, viral hepatitis, when they are infected by a virus, or transplant rejection. Also, there can be some role in the Th1 mediated. Uh, this cytotoxicity may play a role in diabetes, okay? 
Um, remember this thing work, work together. Okay, it's impossible to separate things in the immune system as if they were alone. Most important, the examples that I put there, okay, we directly kill cells after a transplant, viral hepatitis. In the cytotoxic, uh, CDA mediated type cytotoxic. And there you have the examples, okay? Delayed hypersensitivity. You have the antigen presenting cell showing the antigen to a CD4 cell. Okay, I hope you remember that this is the MHC molecule, and this is the T cell receptor and the antigen in between, okay? Notice how these CD4 cells, if they become Th1, they start producing interferon and tumor necrosis factor to stimulate macrophages, to stimulate phagocytosis and inflammation. And here we have the CD4 cells of the class TH17 producing some cytokines. This part, I don't recommend you to memorize this part because it's more complicated. Stimulating neutrophils that lead to inflammation and tissue injury. In the second case, the T cell mediated cytotoxicity, you have the cytotoxic cell CD8 directly binding to what type of MHC? Is this? One. 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 This is a normal cell. That is a target cell that is infected by a virus. Or it's a cell that becomes that is part of another person, a donor, organ donor. Okay? MHC class one presents proteins to the CD8. And if this antigen matches, uh, this seed cytotoxic cell becomes activated and kills the target cell. Examples, tuberculin skin test reactions, PPD, contact dermatitis, poison ivy, which is a type of contact dermatitis, multiple sclerosis, Crohn's disease, and type 1 diabetes mellitus. Okay, some of these diseases are going to be studied in the future, but it's important to know the pathophysiologic basis of them. Okay? Pathophysiologic basis behind them. Because from the pathogenesis comes the treatment. And then you have to understand why we use certain drugs like monoclonal antibodies in order to treat some of these conditions and what is the objective of the treatment. This is for you to study, okay? This is simply a summary of everything that we have been talking about, type one, two, three, and four hypersensitivity, trying to make it as simple as possible. Remember, study this with the website that explains everything very clear and has even some diagrams that are very easy to understand. In the second part, we are gonna be talking about food allergy. Okay. Simply is an allergic reaction to proteins that are present in the food. Okay, can be sometimes mediated by IgE. Okay. In some cases non-IgE mediated. And sometimes there is a combination of mechanisms of action, as we are gonna see. There are uh, different things uh, in the etiology. Remember, uh, for the etiology of any disease, you have to consider genetic and environmental factors, personal, behavioral factors of people, also educational factors, okay. because if someone is allergic to wheat and they don't know what thing contains wheat, they are very likely to be eating something with wheat every day. The same with soy, the same with different things. Sometimes it's very difficult to eat something that doesn't contain eggs. Again, if someone doesn't know how to read a label of a food, they are going to be eating different things that they are allergic to. So education also plays a role. Up to this day, we haven't identified any gene that uh, predisposes to allergies. Probably there are thousands that work in combination. And different proteins like milk, eggs, peanuts, wheat, soy, nuts, fish, shellfish, sesame, different things. The list can be very long. These are the most common ones. 
This is an example of a cutaneous finding food allergy after ingestion of peanuts. Okay, we are going to have classic characteristic of urticaria or sometimes digestive or respiratory symptoms, depending on the specific patient. There are some environmental factors that we have to have in mind. Okay, the hygiene hypothesis that you already know because of overstimulation of the TH2 uh, response as a result of lack of TH1 stimulation. The reduction in dietary antioxidants, okay, if we don't eat enough fruits, vegetables, or things that contain antioxidants, of course we are gonna be likely to have more these and other diseases. Excess or deficiency of vitamin D, notice this, okay, now, I know many people that have uh, blood tests and they are diagnosed with low vitamin D and they are taking vitamin D as crazy. <laughs> many supplements, milk with vitamin D, this with vitamin D, everything with vitamin D. So the excess is also bad. Remember vitamin D is one of the lipid soluble vitamins and it's gonna accumulate in the liver and it's gonna accumulate under the skin in the fat tissue. So we can have an overdose that is as bad as the low dose. Okay, so be careful with uh, uh, this. Here, I put a link to the cutaneous exposure, okay, for you to read about this study. Uh, of course, this is not for the test, it's for you to, if you want to know more about this. And protective factors taking omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids, okay. There are several studies that demonstrate that increasing the consumption of omega-3 fatty acids is uh, inversely related to asthma and inversely related to allergies. Be careful if someone has allergies to shell shellfish or fish, okay? Don't recommend anything that you are not sure the patient can take, no matter how healthy you consider it is. Now the clinical presentation depends on if it's IgE or non-IgE mediated. Okay, the IgE mediated is an allergic reaction, okay? Instead of something that, uh, that uh, we inhale, etc., is to something that we eat, okay? Occurs within two hours of exposure. The same uh, clinical presentation, pruritus, hives, angioedema of the skin, flushing, sneezing, rhinorrhea, nasal congestion, metallic taste, all of these symptoms, stride or if they have angioedema of the larynx, okay, sense of choking, dyspnea, different um, respiratory manifestations, sometimes simply gastrointestinal manifestations like nausea, vomiting, cramping, bloating, diarrhea, conjunctival inje injection, lacrimation, periorbital edema, and in severe cases, they can even have arrhythmias, like cardia, hypotension, shock, and cardiac arrest. They simply can have an anaphylactic shock as a result of this food allergy. Notice that we are exactly repeating the same, but in this case with allergic re uh, reactions to food. The non-IgE mediated, okay, present not as acutely within two hours as the uh, IgE mediated ones. This normally present in a more chronic form, presenting with subacute symptoms, sometimes isolated only to the GI tract or the skin. Okay, I'm mentioning here two examples. One is called food protein induced enterocolitis syndrome. Okay, there you have the uh, explanation there. We are not gonna enter in too much detail. I simply put the concept there for you to know what it is. We are gonna focus more on celiac disease. Okay, celiac disease. Um, is again the same. Is again the same in the pathogenesis. Okay, celiac disease is simply a systemic condition that is triggered by proteins that are present in gluten. Okay, gluten is present in wheat, rye, barley, and some other related grains. Okay. Normally there is an immune activation in the small intestine that will lead to atrophy of the villi and hypertrophy of the intestinal crypts. Remember the villi 
are these structures that we have to increase the surface of absorption. So if they are atrophied, there will be decreased absorption in the wall's small intestine. So these patients are going to present with a malabsorption syndrome. Okay, and if we don't absorb nutrients, we are likely to have diarrhea, and we are having likely to have nutritional problems because of lack of different nutrients. Okay? Also, part of the food that shouldn't get into the large intestine is going to get there, and it's going to be metabolized by intestinal bacteria, producing gas, producing different types of uh, compounds that are going to create bloating, are going to create discomfort, and are going to create several GI tract symptoms. So malabsorption, GI discomfort, diarrhea, and of course the nutritional problem that result from this. Okay, when this occurs, there will be an in inflammatory reaction in the small intestine in the walls, attracting lymphocytes in the epithelial layer and also in the lamina propria. Okay, there are going to be manifestations, GI manifestations and malabsorption, and some diverse systemic manifestations that can affect every organ system, depending on what nutrient is in effect, depending on the severity of the inflammatory reaction. Now, we were talking before about the major histocompatibility complex, or human leukocyte antigen. Okay, remember this uh, is unique for every person. Everybody here has a diverse combination of different human leukocyte antigens that are inherited from our parents. Okay, we inherit several from our father and several from our mother, so we have a combination of them. It's like uh, if you are playing the lottery, okay, you receive, for example, the number one, four, and seven from your father, and the number seven, three, and two from your mother. So you have two sevens, and the rest, the other three, the other four are different. And maybe your sibling inherited more or less the same that you inherited, or maybe not. Okay, so finding a donor that matches a person is sometimes very complicated. Normally, the ideal donor is oneself, or a homozygous uh, twin. Okay, it's very difficult to find someone that really matches this HLA. These human leukocytes antigens are going to have different names, okay, that you not necessarily need to study. This is one example of uh, MHC uh, complexes or, or human leukocyte antigens, HLA DQ2. HLA DQ8, okay? People who inherit either or are at risk of developing celiac disease, okay? This is a necessary causative factor. That means it has to be there. If someone doesn't have these HLAs, they are never gonna develop celiac disease. Of course, there is something else that is called gluten intolerance. That has nothing to do with celiac disease. We can have gluten intolerance as we have intolerance to many other things. Simply, every time we eat gluten, we are going to have intestinal discomfort, or we can have diarrhea, because maybe our intestinal flora acts different, or is different, than the intestinal flora of other people. Or maybe the, the digestive enzymes work differently, but we don't have any immune reaction against gluten, as it happens in celiac disease. Okay, so I want you to listen very well to this because a diet, a gluten-free diet is very difficult and it's very expensive. And we don't have any reason to be making a gluten-free diet if we really don't need it. Okay, it's better to take some digestive enzymes or take some probiotics if we need to fix something with the intestinal flora than trying to do a gluten-free diet. Yeah? This is very common. How do you know that you have celiac disease and not just uh, you have to do tests. You have to look for antibodies in your blood against gluten, against gliadine, against tissue transglutaminase, against different things. There are specific markers for celiac disease. Okay? And even some people have these markers and then they go away. Some people develop a transient celiac disease. You detect the antibodies and then when you repeat the test, they don't have more antibodies. 
So they stop be having celiacs. Okay? Now, notice this. Most people, because now you can have a genetic test and have this human leukocyte antigen. In fact, I have one of them. Okay? They send me the test, or oh, you are at risk of developing celiac disease. Okay. <laughs> Most people with them <laughs> never develop celiac disease. There have to be several things. Okay. What can be the risk? What, what can be the reason behind celiac disease? Mind someone who is genetically predisposed. Someone who has the H HLA, uh, one of these HLAs. One day, they have a gastroenteritis, a diarrhea, an infection in the GI tract that damages the epithelium, the tight junctions between the epithelial cells. They get broken, and at the same time, they're eating something that contains gluten, and gluten passes, and you create an inflammatory response in a critical period in life. Okay? This can be one of the reasons. Skin exposure to gluten, different things. But there has to be a combination of environmental and genetic factors. Okay? The timing of initial gluten exposure is hypothesized as being one of the factors that determines why some people develop and some other people don't develop, even though they have the same genetic uh, composition. The timing of initial gluten exposure, gastrointestinal infection, leading to antigen mimicry, okay, or direct damage to the intestinal epithelial barrier, leading to abnormal exposure of the mucosa to gluten peptides, which are environmental factors for this infection, for this uh, condition. These are the normal villi, and these are them when they are, they have atrophy, okay, it's almost completely flat, the mucosa. We have, when we develop celiac disease, a loss of tolerance to gliadin, which is one of the components of gluten. Gliadin peptides derived from this uh, gluten in wheat, rye, and berry. This protein, gliadin, gets access to the lamina propria because of destruction of the tight junctions, okay, or because of transcytosis. And then we have also, or we can have a sampling of the intestinal lumen by dendritic cells. Notice that I put a question mark there. This is simply one of the theories because in some cases you don't find any uh, disruption of the tight junctions. You don't find any factor that explains this inflammatory or infectious condition. So some studies say that the dendritic cells, for me, it's hard to believe. Once in a while, go out to the lumen and sample the lumen <laughs> and then go back. So can you imagine a dolphin or something, <laughs> a whale or something going out and in? I don't know. Simply push, put a question mark there because I'm not sure how they can prove this. But I have to tell you what they think. <laughs> Now, when these peptides enter below the epithelial cells, they simply trigger a immune response, stimulating the innate and the adaptive immune cells in our system. Okay, and this will lead to cell death and tissue remodeling with atrophy of the villi, hyperplasia of the crypts that are induced by the Th1 cytotoxic T lymphocytes. The TH2 response triggers plasma cell maturation and subsequent anti-gliadin and anti-tissue transglutaminase antibody production. These are the markers that you are going to use in order to diagnose if someone has um, celiac disease. Okay? Anti-gliadin and anti-TTG, tissue transglutaminase. And these are the findings, okay, diarrhea, bloating, abdominal discomfort, anemia as a result of malabsorption of iron. And you can find uh, nutritional deficiencies of all the ones that you want to imagine, okay? <coughs> Something that is sometimes very characteristic is dermatitis herpetiformis, okay? Um, I don't know in what proportion of the population with celiac disease you find this, 
but this is probably one of the only things that people have in the vignettes to tell you that this is celiac disease without giving you the antibodies. Okay? And give you patients with bloating, diarrhea, and abdominal discomfort. That occurs once in a while without known food exposures. The patient has anti tissue transglutaminase antibodies and anti gliding antibodies. Oh, this is celiac disease. I don't want to give you the antibodies. The patient has vesicular lesions on the trunk, on this and that. This is dermatitis hypertrophic. So this is celiac disease. The dermatitis, does that happen like after a gluten exposure, almost like a, mm -hmm. or is it? Yeah, normally these things happen together. OK, there you have uh, how this looks like. OK. I saw it. It says biopsy proven. So if you take a biopsy that comes out negative, Definitely don't have a celiac disease. Uh, in the GI tract, you mean? For, well, for the dermatitis. Ah, for, well, that is a very difficult question. Mm -hmm. Because saying you definitely not have. You can cut the gluten for a while. And I can answer way. that. If this biopsy comes negative, that rules out completely or definitely celiac disease. I can answer that. Okay. Who was asking? I think that if you if you cut the gluten completely, sometimes they go away and then that's how you know. Yes, but cutting the gluten completely sometimes is almost is you have to drink gluten free water. <laughs> <laughs> Not as much, maybe not as much. No, no, even a minimum amount of gluten triggers the whole thing. It's an all or non response. You have to cut completely. Completely, not reduce the dose, or it's not like lactose. And you can take a cortadito and nothing <laughs> happens. You have to completely cut. <laughs> Has nothing to do with weight. It's simply you want to avoid discomfort if it's if it produces discomfort. Okay. Uh -huh. You said that the reactions are like all in one, whether they're gonna, like everybody's gonna have the same severity or it's, no. It's no, no, no. I mean, your clinical presentation is gonna occur no matter what is the dose of gluten. Okay, that you, in, in, in. it's not like, let me reduce gluten, like you reduce lactose or reduce sugar or, or reduce fat. I mean, this is, it's like having a tiny bit of penicillin or, you're not going to have the allergic reaction. I may have half the pill or, or half the, the injection. It will happen. Okay. <coughs> well, the mixed one. Simply here we have a combination of allergic IgE mediator or type 1 hypersensitivity and cell mediated reaction. Okay. And then we have, for example, atopic dermatitis. Okay, that can occur as a result of eggs, wheat, soy, milk, and other allergens. And some conditions that we are going to study in the next semester that are eosinophilic esophagitis, eosinophilic gastritis and eosinophilic gastroenteritis. And this is simply, some people have uh, something that looks like a chronic gastritis or peptic or acid peptic disease. And you try to treat them with omeprazole, ranitidine, or any other H2 blockers, and it doesn't get better. Okay. And you do an endoscopy, you're going to see the inflammation in the stomach or in the mucous membrane of the esophagus. When you take a biopsy, instead of seeing inflammatory cells like neutrophils or lymphocytes, etc., you see many eosinophils. So you treat these people with anti-allergic corticosteroids and anti-allergics, most importantly, for example, swallowing corticosteroids, and this goes away. Okay? It's an allergic process affecting the mucous membrane of the esophagus, stomach, or the GI tract in general. So atopic dermatitis and different types of eosinophilic, esophagitis, gastroenteritis. 